Um, and I just wanted to give you uh, my definition, I guess, of a poet. So as a poet, basically I am a witness uh, to my own interior life and to the life of the world. So you'll be hearing from both of those places. Um, if there's a very short poem, I will read it twice. There's only a few. And the reason for this is the first time is for my mouth and the second is for my heart, okay? So the first one is, every woman should carry. Every woman should carry a box of matches, a knife, a handkerchief, a pencil, pens run out of ink, forgiveness, a thousand pounds of courage, space for loving. A woman should carry a warm shawl, enough grace, and a small bottle of fine cognac. <laughs> <laughs> a heart not broken in too many places and the ability to forget and enough endurance. This is called George's funeral. It is a blue spring sky. I walk with you out of the hospital, released. You are told you are HIV positive. We eat Chinese before we attend George's wake, already ravaged and dead by AIDS. I watch you look upon his face in the casket, wondering, afraid, I turn away. And this is called uh, a sweet of longing. Alone by the lake, a little drunk, the woman with the broken heart wishes for a lover to make dinner for. She wants to make pasta, heat up her homemade sauce, place a loaf of peasant bread on the pine trestle table, light candles, open a bottle of good red wine, fill two goblets, dish the pasta and sauce onto two white plates beside sky blue napkins. Eat slowly. Talk quietly or not at all. The company of a lover enough. After dinner, she breaks a bar of dark chocolate into pieces and sets them beside slices of apple. Finds her bottle of cognac, <laughs> fills the snifters, takes her lover's hand, climbs the stairs. Alone by the lake with cigarettes and a bottle of beer, no book and pen, a little drunk perhaps, the woman wishes. This is called Ideas Without Words. I leave words out. Is it because I don't need them? 
In truth, it is because I have forgotten them. Words are often clouds without centers. One needs meaning to find a word. Having forgotten the word, meaning remains in the shade. Once my word was an arrow, precise as it hit its target, a bullseye even. Now the bow is heavy and hard to load the arrow. Where or what is the target? What is a poet who is losing words, who stumbles <clears throat> about in the dark of no words, not exact words, wrong words? Sometimes hours pass, even days, and then I retrieve the lost word. I am frightened. I try to find the right word, but it is slimy, greasy, slips away. I am losing my vocabulary. Yesterday, I could not find a word. I ended up asking a university staff member, could she find someone to sit with a student as she took my exam. Yes, if you will fill out this form, we can provide you a proctor. The island of lost words is becoming more real, not so far away from my shore. All the words I've lost are populating the island. All those lost words, not making sentences or poems, prisoners awaiting for extinction. A poet makes things. I am a poet. Maybe being is what I want more of. Days emptying of making. Days simply of being. <clears throat> this is a little prose piece. It was the summer of 1964 when I lived on St. Mark's Place with a former roommate who had, lucky her, transferred from Mary Baldwin College, my Southern White Presbyterian Women's College in Virginia, to NYU continuing to major in drama. I was a drama and English major at Mary Baldwin, double major at my father's insistence since only whores and homosexuals were in the theater. <laughs> that summer, I ran the light show at the Dom before it became the electric circus and showed slides of amoebas on the walls <laughs> while people danced. It was a summer of mescal, mushrooms, and acid. There was a wild fury in the air like nothing before or since. <laughs> it was August nights, sleeping on the fire escape listening to Chicago Transit Authority and Sweet Baby James. The colors of wonder gilded everything and everyone. There was nothing but skin and dreams and visions clarified by acid and mescaline, moving matter to spirit, and flirting with the guy with the long eyelashes, shaving Italian ice in neon colors <laughs> on the corner. <laughs> Lucky strikes, bottles of beer, matutes with that ubiquitous bottle, and flowers everywhere it seemed. 
In Washington Square or Cafe Wa, a very Dylan played guitar. And me sitting outside the Cafe Reggio drinking iced cappuccino with whipped cream, college far away. <laughs> the fragrance of roasting lamb on a rotating spit from Mamoon's next door and going and knowing that too soon, <clears throat> September loomed like a policeman with a nightstick. <laughs> September and going back, going back to compulsory chapel and rules, no drinking within 25 miles of the college, <laughs> <laughs> and me always in trouble. <laughs> and Arnie, Arnie would stay at St. Mark's place and I would never find him again. <laughs> this is called the Sunday Blues. I've got the rainy Sunday blues again, pouring down blues. Maybe rain will change to snow. Late afternoon longings merge with lonely hours. I try to ward them off with a fire. Mellow memories flicker in those flames. <clears throat> Outside, snow falling. Inside, those flaming blues again. <laughs> this is uh, a poem uh, <coughs> written for Robley Whitson. Mm -hmm. Robley was a mentor to me. Uh, a Catholic priest, um, and he and I started a writing group about 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. Some of the members are here. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> so a poem written for Robley. I carried you in a cooler bag, disguised to bring no attention. I untaped the black cardboard box. Preparations had been made an hour car ride for a lifetime. After pomp and circumstance, a funeral mass by a famous cardinal praying over you, I did not attend since he hid protecting pedophile priests giving them other parishes and more children to injure. I knew you would understand me not attending such a ceremony. Executing your wishes, you entrusted me to bring you to sea and salt water, to a gentle place where nuns prayed where mercy was offered here beside the sea, where you said mass for the nuns for years. You entrusted me to see your poems were gifted to readers. You trusted me to carry you to a place away from curious eyes. I knelt by the rocks, <coughs> Pouring you into water, watching you fill the cracks beneath the rocks, watching minnows swim through you, watching the swirls the laughing small waves make, stirring into the rocks, watching you mix with all. Beyond the small island, a barren rock, hoping some of you will make your way there, comforted by water, wave, and wind. I set you free under a blazing sun, watching you mix, receive, return, wave after wave, some of you settling between the rocks, 
the sand and mercy. I see a small boat not far from shore, remembering your warnings rowing on Lake Orma, the peace of dipping oars, the grace of glide, remembering you swimming with your own baptism, remembering the peace of your body moving through water, now bone and ash. You are one with water and sunlight in the language of a turning tide. Mm -hmm. This is visitors during the pandemic. <laughs> Do they see this flight of birds flying over the earth, free soaring and dipping, resting now and then to nest? I cannot but wonder if they saw the nearly two million dying people. The birds build their yearly nests over the light fixture on my porch. The raccoon comes to the glass porch door, standing and staring as though he had an invitation. <laughs> the possum comes to the porch and rubs himself between the wooden slats. The rabbits nibble July sweet grass. The fox saunters stealthily across the lawn. The deer bend their necks and eat the apples I leave for them. And one afternoon, a bear slowly ambled down my drive, heading for the woods behind the house. And one early morning, a bobcat searches the grass for something I cannot see. The squirrels argue with the blue jays for a morning toast. <laughs> Later, I give the sparrows the end of a loaf of bread as I shelter safe and alone. These creatures have been kind in their visits, reminding me who else is out there living without masks. <laughs> So this is a poem uh, written in 2012, uh, Sandy Hook. But now it's also for another child killed by gun violence by a child with a gun 20 years later. The country is stained with sorrow. Anger erupts. Why isn't there a war on guns more fervent than the failing war on drugs? A sick young boy reached desperation and confusion. We are confounded by questions that may ever, never be answered. Illness, not evil. And blood runs among those tiny desks and chairs. Stains the paper chains for Christmas trees. Stains the gingerbread houses. Grief swallows anger. Anger vomits grief. Tears fill Lake Zor. Never, never, never again. And yet, again and again and again. Bullets rain on the innocent. What neighbor is in this pain we cannot see? or will not see. Grief floods the roads, the highways and airwaves. We are drowning in grief and anger. 
We are mute, but we pray. We light candles. We weep. We pray. We weep again and again. <clears throat> This is called listening. She finds her silence in snow. Snow silence suits her. Then the melt. And with snow melt goes silence. Always listening for it, she lives her busy days and years tumble after each other then one dawn, watching the fire flame, she hears it. She feels it deeper than dreaming, listening hard and close. She finds her silence within. For all who are suffering from opioid addiction and those who love them, it's finally over for the one craving the high, for the other craving help, for the one wanting the high, over for the one dying for the fix. Over for the endless day and nights, wondering and praying and crying. Over for the one promising to call home and not doing it. Over for the one waiting by the phone. Where is she? What city? What town? What gutter? Over the lies told to hide the truth. Over for the believer trying to believe the lies. Peace, I hope, for the one in the ground. For the mother who told me, I'm grieving. I'm angry. I'm relieved. Peace, too. Finding meaning in a deadly virus. Something out there greater than us, something we did not choose, chose us. I find meaning amid grief and sorrow, suffering and death, an opportunity individually, in community, in country, globally. We are transforming being transformed through the losses, isolation, loneliness, and grief by something we did not choose that chose humankind. To learn what we forgot, love, and the temporariness of time. Healing at a distance by care of family and strangers, where compassion and empathy are victorious over selfishness and greed. We are being transformed by something we did not choose. <clears throat> and this was for an old friend of mine, Lonnie Black. Oh. Um, and all poet friends who died. When a poet dies, the possibility of words dies too. Scratching paper to explain mysteries, to name the unnameable, Pairing together words that dance, cajole, brighten, define. He lived inking the struggle, the full weight 
of words. This is called, it is a full green morning before the death of George Floyd, May 25th, 2020. I am working from my perch just above the treetops, sitting, seeing into leaves below. Lilies of the valley hide beneath spreading blue, bleeding hearts, waiting to be picked and placed by my window, where violets and forget-me-nots once held a place. A single purple iris sits beside Quan Yen, she who hears the cries of the world. The scent of the lilacs by the blue door, fainter. Birthing spring green darkness, a late spring, June arriving in a few days. I am something like happy here in this green quiet. Then I hear breaking news. January 6, 2021. There's a quote by Virginia Woolf. The world wavered and quivered and threatened to burst into flames. Today, the Capitol is being stormed by Trump's followers, scaling the walls of democracy like frat boys on a binge. One bare chested with war paint and horns, others maskless screaming, kill them, kill Pence, kill Pelosi, fuck them, fuck them all, as though they knew no other words. Sitting hour after hour, switching channels, angry and frightened, knowing it is not over. The siege and the plague are upon us, an insurrection of a mob directed by a pumpkin-headed demagogue as his followers take selfies, laughing, jeering, sneering, taunting as they break windows, scatter documents, and shatter the doors of justice. Mm -hmm. On my knees again, I look to the stars. This is the year of disease and destruction. What lies in the ashes of a burning country? Well, this is called Words, and then I decided to add another title called Capitalism. <laughs> We know words have meaning, but what would happen if you had to purchase every word? <laughs> if we had to buy words, <laughs> having secured a few, we would own them and then be free to rent words out <laughs> for a price. <laughs> <laughs> what would the fee to purchase love or its rental fee be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would happen to those who couldn't afford to rent the words mm -hmm. they needed? Mm -hmm. What happens to language? Will someone mm -hmm. figure out how to steal words? Mm -hmm. Will a billionaire or trillionaire mm -hmm. purchase a dictionary of words cornering the market? Mm -hmm. yeah. What next? Would someone purchase love, l'amour in French, <laughs> and then own it in all languages? <laughs> what would the price of love be? Thank mm -hmm.
So this is the objections of a white privileged woman. These days, I hear the wild fury of fear, of maelstrom, hurling into a circus of confusion and lies. Object to politics of us and them. Object to what or who feeds fear. Fear feeds impotence. Object, it shrinks a person that imitates. Object to racism, breeding despair. Object to despair, feeding violence. Object to gender discrimination, sexism. Islamophobia, xenophobia, religious intolerance. Object to the loss of freedom of choice. <laughs> Object to the loss of freedom to worship without fear. It is time to object, risk, resist, give voice. Hope without action is silent. Hope with action may change everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trees. <laughs> when I was six, I named a tree in a nearby vacant lot, the heaven tree. <laughs> Sitting in its saddle, not far off the ground, playing cowboys with a boy younger than me who took my directions well. <laughs> we spied on the neighborhood from there. In his yard, we'd hide among the blossoms of a blooming cherry tree. Trees were safe places for me, their limbs comforting. <coughs> Asking little of a girl, even then, questioning authority. <laughs> As the years went by, I read the transcendentalists, Thoreau, Emerson, Whitman, the romantics, Wordsworth, Shelley, Coleridge, and others. In them, finding a familiar sense of mystery, finding pantheism, the religion of a great creating spirit, it suited me, believing in a divinity within trees and stones and animals and sky. Living alone in these days of the pandemic, still finding in trees a kind of safety and solace. I was saying to someone earlier, this is the first time I've read this particular poem because I retired from Yukon two years ago. And uh, since it is about a class, I never read it publicly before. Yukon Modern Novel Class, <laughs> a semester of ideas. <clears throat> One retired nurse, early 50s, a hand waver, <laughs> a 95 year old woman <laughs> auditing, one young man who cut off his own hand, one young overweight woman who has custody of her two siblings, works two jobs and undergoing her second round of chemo. One young man with Asperger's syndrome who does not case in my class. One young woman, seven months pregnant, an A chemistry major who put herself in rehab 
for drug addiction. Remaining white and black and mixed, most working full or part-time, faces weary with expectations. Virginia Woolf, Albert Camus, Hemingway, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin. As they write their papers, I say, you're learning to be wordsmiths. They know me in a way no lover or husband has ever known me. Waking and rummaging still in that past, last memory, dream time, I look to the sky behind my pillows, feeling that brisk air from a window that never quite closes. <laughs> in that sky sight, trees have their still air, a scent of things growing beneath brown leaves comforting new green. This is the certainty of spring returning. I am whole <clears throat> again. When I no longer make the words or the colors or the strokes, the signs of language, painting and writing, when there is no more need for speech, just the noticing will be enough. Ancient belongings. I feel an ancient belonging to islands, to the edge of the sea, the turning of the tide, the protection of steep, rocky hillsides, the paths of light on water, the trail of clouds. I belonged many eons to times when there was little governing of people, when I was free to give homage to dawn and dusk, sunrise and sunset, once I was a grateful anchoress, hermit, monk, or nun. Still in gratitude, I listen to the sacred hum of the universe. My longings, a search for the unity of all my ancient souls. So there, uh, Two more poems. Um, Once upon a time, before there was a word for time, everything was now. There wasn't a word for time past, only memory, something that happened in your head. There was no word for future. There was only now and the next now. <laughs> Once upon a time, just now, just is, only now for everything. <laughs> now, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, <laughs> this is the last poem, and it is. Uh, it's a little bit long, it's two parts. And it's called Voices from the Ukraine. Part one. Watching this war on civilization, I weep into my hands. Then I hear a female Ukrainian journalist, better to die than live on my knees. The following are all voices evacuated. A moment to reflect does nothing. 
Our life is now one bag. Help us stop this war. I lost everyone and lost the meaning of life. I am truly scared that this hatred will be with us for generations to come. Ukraine is my soul. It is my home. I feel no fear. A teacher says as she goes back to calm her students. We don't look away. It's painful inside. President Zelensky, a few small towns don't exist anymore. They are just gone. I do not know where to run. Kill me now. This is what hatred looks like. Damn them all. I don't know who is guilty, who is right. Just finish this, he says, as he dumps black body bags into a massive grave. Day 22, President Zelensky's speech to US Congress. The destiny of our people is being decided. I have a dream. I have a need to protect the sky. Do not look away. Close the sky. Peace is more important than income. Day 23. This morning, <clears throat> A kindergarten, an elementary school, a supermarket, a maternity hospital, mm -hmm. an art school, a library, a theater, all bombed. This land is soaked in blood, bitterness, and despair. Someone says poverty, death, and homelessness are everywhere don't know what to feel. There is no one to bury the dead. I am alone. I have nothing left. Day 26. The word is Armageddon. We have been killed without mercy. 3,000 Ukrainians are being deported from Maripol by Russians, sending them to filtration camps where they were told to sign, quote, that they will stay in that area for two to three years and work for free. Mm -hmm. One woman asks, if you want to save your children, you go with them or stay and die. Wouldn't you go? Day 28, Ukrainian pilot. I can feel the rush of adrenaline in my body because every flight is fight. Day 30. When Ukrainian children were asked what they wanted, not to hear enemy planes overhead, to listen to music, to breathe fresh air, wash my hands, to use toilets. Everything is destroyed. Dead bodies everywhere. We simply want to live. Is this the last time 
we will see each other. Chef Jose Andres of the World Central Kitchen. We will not let the Ukrainians walk alone. Part two. What do you carry in your backpack, your suitcase, your arms? What did you quickly decide to take with you when you heard the shell fire and bombing, when you saw the tanks snaking around the city? Did you see the Russian tank plow over a car, a man inside rescued by the jaws of life? Did you remember the solitary man protesting before a tank in Tiananmen Square? What do you carry beside your papers and passport, medical history, money, some food? What do you carry beside your children, mothers, sisters? Air raid sirens always screaming now. You lift your child from a hospital bed, wrap him in fierce love and hope and carry him. What else is there to carry but love and hope? You carry the heaviness of leaving. You see the assembly line of people making Molotov cocktails to hurl at the enemy. What do you carry? What and who do you leave behind? Do you carry music, poems, stories? What do you carry walking day after day after day away from your home? What you carry gets heavier. <coughs> you hold your child, dog or cat closer. There will be time perhaps for the weight of memories of what and who is left behind. Fleeing, there is only one day after another. Walking and walking and walking, thousands in front of you, thousands behind you. The lines of women and children carrying fear and love and hope move slowly forward. Watching this war on civilization, I weep into my hands, and then I hear a female Ukrainian journalist, better to die than live on my knees. Thank you. Mm -hmm.